songs that are filled with grief and with sadness and with emotion uh, are actually quite uh, powerful, and, and that genre of music and song is quite popular. Um, I think partially because sometimes when we listen to a sad song, some of us can identify with the lyrics. Sometimes we can, we can have that sense that I'm not the only one going through this valley and this difficult time. And uh, this past week, I actually spent a little time on Wednesday uh, looking up the most popular sad songs of all time. And uh, one of them was uh, by R.E.M., Everybody Hurts. This was an anti-suicide song, was written as an anti-suicide song. Lead, lead singer for R.E.M., Michael Stripe, sings, Don't Let Yourself Go, Because Everybody Cries, Everybody Hurts Sometime. Also at the top of the list, Ain't No Sunshine, written by Bill Withers, a song uh, that was written about two adults struggling through life, struggling through problems, and resorting to alcoholism to deal with their problems. That's what the song is about. We've all sung to this song before, Ain't No Sunshine When She's Gone, Only Darkness Every Day. Ain't No Sunshine When She's Gone, and This House Just Ain't No Home Anytime She Goes Away. And then what is probably, in my opinion, one of the absolute saddest and most depressing video songs uh, is Johnny Cash's Hurt. Um, This is a song that Johnny Cash writes and sings about regret and loss and the human condition. And the song starts out, I hurt myself today to see if I still feel. I focus on the pain the only thing that's real. Probably the one that really gets me, and maybe it's because I'm a dad, but uh, the song written and sung by uh, Eric Clapton, Tears of Heaven, a song that he writes after his four-year-old son um, accidentally falls out of a window and dies. (laughs) Would you hold my hand if I saw you in heaven? Would you help me stand if I saw you in heaven? I'll find my way through night and through day because I know I just can't stay here in heaven. I, I was, when I was doing this research and looking up these top most popular sad songs of all time, uh, it was Wednesday afternoon. By the end of the afternoon, I was like, why am I so discouraged? Because I'm listening to all these sad songs for an hour. And it's the power that music has upon us. Now, I begin this way because as we continue with our series called Soundtrack, uh, we're, every Sunday on, uh, in the summer and right into a little bit of, Jan- of September, we're looking at different psalms. And last week we looked at a great Psalm 139 that talks about how God has made us and how God has created us. And today we talk about Psalm 13. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn there or turn in your phones. But Psalm 13 is an incredibly sad song. It is written by David as he is despondent and he's depressed and he's sad and it's because he's going through this prolonged crisis. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at this psalm. What we're going to learn from David is is basically uh, not only a little bit about sadness from a spiritual perspective, but also what what to do. What do I do when I'm sad? What do I do when I'm going through crisis? So I'm going to read the psalm first, and then we'll jump into it. Psalm 13, it says, for the director of music, so it's a song, a psalm, a psalm it says, or a song of David. Verse 1, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that 
especially for those who've walked in here today with emotions of sadness and discouragement, for those that have walked in here today with some sort of crisis going on in their life, we ask that you would especially speak through your word to them, to their souls and to their minds about how you care for them, love them, and what your plan is to try and get them back on their feet. We love you and you pray, we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I've outlined the text for you in your study guide. I wanna encourage you to grab that real quick. That's very practical things. Um, what we see in this very first two verses is David explaining how bummed out he is. He is just absolutely bummed out. Do we have that slide up there? Um, and so he's basically saying there's three or four reasons why I'm discouraged. And, and he says this, I'm sad because God has forgotten me. He's forgotten me. That's the first thing he says. How long will you forget me? Forever? He says, I'm discouraged because God doesn't seem to care about me. I can't see you. I can't hear you. I can't feel you. I, you must be too busy for me. You don't want to spend time with me. Clearly, you want to spend time with all those happy, successful Christians, and I'm not one of those at this point in time. I'm down in the dumps. Where are you? He then goes on to say, I'm confused and second-guessing myself. Verse 2, how long with I, must I wrestle with my thoughts? These thoughts of you leaving me, uh, that, that phrase there is really talking about David saying, you know, I'm looking for your guidance, but I don't seem to get any. I want, I want to know, should I turn this way? Should I turn that way? And I can't hear you. So I guess I'm going to have to figure it out on my own. I'm going to have to wrestle with my thoughts about how to solve the problem and the crisis that I'm in at this time. And then finally, interestingly enough, he says, I'm overwhelmed with sorrow. Day after day after day, I wake up with sorrow and pain in my heart. That's what he says. But then he adds this phrase in question, how long will my enemy triumph over me? I'm not only overwhelmed with sorrow, I'm feeling resentful towards other people. One counselor claimed that 90% of the cases that they dealt with, of people dealing with depression, nine out of 10 people also had resentment and anger issues. In other words, one of the triggers that sends us into discouragement and depression is not having solved relational issues with other people, causing us to feel resentful, causing us to feel anger, which if you don't deal with it, it eventually shoots you into discouragement. Now, the worst part about all this is not only does he feel sad and discouraged and confused and resentful, it's going on and on and on and on. He keeps asking the question over and over again in the first couple verses, how long is this going to be? How long am I going to be in this situation? Let's go ahead and hit the next slide. He says, how long will you forget me? How long will you hide your face from me? How long was my wrestle with my thoughts? How long will my enemy triumph over me? I keep going. I mean, I know there's problems in life, but this is going on forever. And it sure seems like so many of us can identify with David's question here and his emphasis on how long is this going to happen? How long am I going to have to deal with these prolonged health problems that just won't go away? How long am I going to have to deal with pain in my marriage? How, how long am I going to have to, to, to deal with, with my son or my daughter that's heading in the wrong direction? How, how long is it going to be before you bring that special person into my life that I, that I can fall in love with and be with them till death do us part? How long do I got to wait? Uh, how long before we get pregnant? You know we want to have kids and we've been, you know, we can't get pregnant. How long is that going to, how long before I get a promotion? that I deserve. Heck, forget the promotion. How long before I get a job? I don't even have a job. How long before my finances get under control? How long before my loved one finally gets a hold of their addiction? How long, God? It's something that all of us at some point in time, whether we verbalize or not, we wonder. I know life's got problems, but this keeps going on and on and on. Now, one of the interesting things that you need to understand from this psalm is that it's very interesting that what prolonged crisis will do to you is it not only will make you sad, it will impact you emotionally, but eventually the domino starts to fall and it begins to also impact you spiritually. That's what's happening to David here. He's not just sharing his feelings. 
It is now bleeding over into his theology and into his relationship with God. It's impacting him emotionally and now also spiritually. I don't have a blank for you to fill out in your study guide, but I would like you to write this down. Let's put the next slide up on the screen. I want you to know for those that are waiting, for those who are asking God how long, with God you need to understand a waiting season is never a wasted season. With God, a waiting season, as you're waiting for him to solve this problem, to fix that issue, to to restore that relationship, as you're waiting on him, it's never a wasted season. He's doing something. Sometimes it's in your life. Sometimes it's in their life. Sometimes I don't know what's going on. You and I might never understand why did he make us go through that stage? Why so long? We might never know till we get to heaven. But the promise and what this book repeatedly states is that he's always up to something. You can trust him. He's always up to something. Now, in the midst of your sadness, in the midst of your despondency, this is very important. There's some things you don't want to do. I have it at the bottom of your study guide. Some things you absolutely don't, five don'ts that you don't want to do in the midst of despondency and discouragement. Don't beat yourself up for being discouraged. There there are some in the Christian community that add to our sadness because they almost give us this feeling that you shouldn't be sad. You should have the joy of the Lord, and why are you moping? You know, don't listen to those people. This book clearly says that some spiritual giants went through discouragement and depression, and and God isn't upset at you if you're sad. Now, I don't think he wants you to stay discouraged. He gives you steps to bounce out of it, but don't further make yourself feel bad because, you know, I should be happy as a Christian. I really am not at this point. Don't beat yourself up for being discouraged. Number two is don't hesitate to open up to other people. Now you have to be wise who you talk to, but essentially that's what David is doing here. This is therapeutic for him to to write down and then put into song, this is how I'm feeling. And whether it's with your pastor or another staff member or whether it's your small group leader or whether it's a good friend or whether it's your spouse or, or whoever it is, you have to be cautious who you share with. But sometimes just talking about it to someone else will actually begin to give you some healing. The third thing is don't make any major decisions during a time of, of major sadness or depression. Why? Because we're not thinking straight. So don't make major decisions. Number four, don't judge others' response to your situation. Don't judge. So you're, some of us, you're going to get into this pit and you're wondering, where are my friends, and why aren't they doing anything? Be very careful to judge other people and how they're responding to you. And last, don't trust your feelings. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own feelings. Why? Because sometimes our feelings are fickle. Sometimes our feelings lie to us about the truth. So you're going to have to find the one that you really need to gravitate towards, um, but be very, very careful about that. So, so here David is down in the dumps, but God's wanting us to, to bounce back, okay? And, and one of the motivating things that I want to share with you, I'm looking forward to August, September when football season comes back on. I love, I love watching football. This is one of my favorite football players of all time. Um, some of you may recognize who that is. That is Walter Payton. He played for the Chicago Bears. He was a running back. He had a flair about him and a grace about him uh, in terms of how he played the game. His nickname was Sweetness. You actually see it on the little towel, on the hand towel that he has, number 34, Sweetness. It's because of how he ran. And he's an icon, not only in the NFL, but especially in Chicago, where I was born. And um, one of the interesting facts about Walter Payton, for a while, he was in the NFL uh, record books because of how many yards he'd, he'd, he'd ran and accomplished in his career. Uh, as a career, he ran over nine miles in rushing yards in the NFL. Nine miles! But here's what you need to understand about Walter Payton. Every 4.6 yards, someone knocked him to the ground. See, even the great ones get knocked to the ground. The issue is not whether you're going to get knocked to the ga- ground. The issue is if you're going to get back up again. That's the question. That's the question. And so as you're struggling because you've just gone through a divorce, if you've just had lost a family member, or your, your job is filled with stress, or someone took advantage of you, or financially you're in a mess, you came in here this morning and you felt like you've been knocked to the ground, 
God's saying to you, I want you to be like Walter Payton. Get back up. Get back up and keep running. Proverbs 24 says this, verse 16. The godly may trip or fall seven times, but they get up again. They get up again. So now what we see is he's bummed out in verses one and two. What we see, I've outlined it for you, he begins to bounce back in verse three and four. And there's some specific things he does that I want to encourage you to do. If you're feeling in a time of sadness, what do I do to get out of this? Number one, double down on your commitment to God in prayer. Double down on your commitment to God and to prayer. So look at what it starts off, he says in verse three. So really what we have in Psalm 13 is it's a prayer that gets turned into a song. Look on me and answer me, Lord my God. You see, here's the thing that David knows and that you and I should know. He addresses God as one with whom we have a covenant relationship with. Not a contract, but a covenant relationship with. Which means that you and I and he has a right to call upon God with the expectation that God is going to answer you. So he's engaging God in prayer and talking to God about his problem. Now, here is the one little wrinkle about this issue, right? I'm challenging you to double down on your commitment to prayer. Here's the wrinkle. Studies tell us that 98% of evangelical Christians, that's us, 98% believe that prayer actually and really makes a difference. Yep, it makes a difference. However, less than 30% of Christians pray for more than 10 minutes a day. We barely pray for our food. We barely pray for our food. We're not even praying 10 minutes a day. So just be honest. Whatever crisis you have in your life, whatever problem you have in your life, whatever situation you're trying to deal with, whatever is making you sad and has knocked you to the ground, how much time do you spend worrying about it? How how much time do you spend mulling around in your head? How much time do you spend talking to other people about it? How much time do do you spend posting about it? Now, take all of that time and compare it to how much time do you spend praying about it? This is not me trying to make you feel guilty because I fall into the same trap sometimes. This is me saying, if you want to get back on your feet, I'm just showing you what David does. He doubles down on prayer. He doubles down on prayer. Go go on a walk on the strand and just pray. Watch how that comes out. It might even be, I don't even know what to ask for, God, but this is what I'm going through and this is what I feel. But begin the discipline of learning to talk to God about your problems, not just talk to yourself or talk to others about your problems. Here's the second thing he does. Uh, Prioritize and intentionally seek wisdom and insight. Prioritize and intentionally seek wisdom and insight. Second part of verse three, give light to my eyes. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. Of all the phrases in this psalm, that's the one that confuses Bible students the most. What is he talking about there? Is he talking actual death? Or is he talking emotional death? I feel like I'm dead on the inside. And people go in all kinds of directions. I, I, I don't, I, I'm not going to speculate on what he means there. But clearly it's pretty heavy. And what he's saying is, God, give me light. I don't know which way I should go. I don't know which way I should turn. I just need some insight. I need some knowledge. Should I do this? Should I go here? Should I shut up? Should I try? What do I do? right? And and, and one of the things when you're dealing with crisis is find wisdom, find insight. You go, I'm not sure how to do that. It starts with God's word. If you're not picking this book up, it's going to be very hard to find wisdom. Then it moves on to God's people. Some of the ways you get wisdom is that they're sitting right around you. They're sitting right around you. And it's as simple as I'm going through this situation. What do you think? What do you think? Now, you don't have to take their advice, but it's God's word, it's God's people, and then it's God's Holy Spirit. Through prayer, say, God, guide me. You know, you want to be careful about leaning into your gut feelings, right? We just talked about don't trust your gut, but but you have to distinguish between your own gut and your own mind talking to you and the Holy Spirit whispering in you, in your ear, what what should I do? So he, he doubles down on prayer. Number two, he prioritizes wisdom, right? And number three, This is my biggest takeaway this morning. Get your eyes off the wrong people. This was incredible. It really spoke to me personally. Now, this is the third time he's brought it up in this psalm. Three times, 
right? I've got this problem. I've got this issue. And David is consumed with his enemies, his foes, people that aren't his friends, people at work that took advantage of him, ex-spouses, people that used to be friends, all these people that we would lump into we're not close to, and they don't seem to like us very much, right? And some of, we have, some of us have a lot, and some of us have a few of those. But he starts out at the end of verse 2, how long will my enemy triumph over me? So one of the interesting things about this psalm is we're not given the historical context. A lot of times the psalm will tell us this is when so-and-so was in the cave, and, when, and it tells us when they wrote it. Here we have no indication of when David writes Psalm 13. Most scholars think that he might be talking about Saul right here, King Saul. King Saul is really resentful towards David because he's going to be the next king. And so there's some issues going on there. So it could be Saul and David's going, it feels like he's getting the upper hand and it feels like he's gloating over my problems. So that's the end of verse two. But now verse four, two times he brings it up. He's consumed with what his enemy is saying about him. And he's consumed about what his enemy or foes are feeling about him, what they're saying and what they're feeling. And we get so consumed, not about only about our problem, but now what adds fuel to the fire is this friend and that person and ex-spouse and mom and dad or whatever, people in your life that you're not getting along with, and what you imagine they're thinking and what you imagine they're saying about your problem or your situation right now. A couple weeks ago, uh, typically, my, my work schedule is to get up super early. I'll work an hour and a half, two hours at my office at home. Then as a break, I kind of take a shower, have another cup of coffee, uh, get in the car and head here to the office, and then I start my meetings here in the office. So I, I went out to the car. I had my briefcase, my cup of coffee, got into the car, turned the engine on, and I saw there was a business card on my windshield wiper. So I, I'm going to pick it up and fly off. So I picked it up, and it was this business card right here. And it says this, it says, we buy junk cars. <laughs> and then English and Spanish, compramos carros fuera de servicio con o sin papeles, which means even if your car is crap, we'll take it off your hands, right? And so I took it, you know, and I saw the couple other cars, all the other cars on the street had this card, so I figured out someone gave them, some kid a bunch of cards and paid them some bucks to put it on everyone's windshield wiper. I kid you not. Three days later, another company with the exact same card. We buy junk cars. And so this time, I became a little self-conscious, right? I mean, I'm like, I know it's not a new car. It's a 10-year-old Camry, but I, I, I literally got out, and no one else had these on their, on their windshield wipers. Just me. And I was like, is my car that bad, right? People are walking by, make sure and put it on that car right there. Listen to me really carefully. You will always have people in your life that make you feel like junk. Sometimes you work with them. Sometimes you go to school with them. What makes it awful is sometimes they're in your family. They make you feel like junk. And either, either they tell you or they suggest it and imply it to you. And what David, what we're learning here and what we see comparatively, verse three verses before, uh, verse four verses before, his attitude towards these people is changing. Before he's consumed with them and now he begins to, it's almost like, I'm not, I'm not gonna worry about them. I gotta stop looking at them. That's the key. You've got to get your eyes off the wrong people. You've got to get your eyes off the wrong people. So he, here's our summary so far. Here's what we've learned. Verse one and two, David is bummed out. Verse three and four, he's beginning to bounce back. And verse five and six, he's back on his feet. He's back on his feet. And, and I wanna show you what, what, what he does. There's, there's two or three things that he does. Number one, he, he, he renews his trust in God. He renews his trust in God. Verse five, for beginning of verse five, I trust in your unfailing love. Now the Psalm started by him questioning God. Where are you? Why don't you care? Why have you forgotten about me? That's how it starts. Verse five, however, I trust in your unfailing love. Last Sunday was a good day for me. After second service, I busted out of here and I ran home because my, my country, my team, Spain, was playing in the Euro Cup finals. 
right? And, and a Spanish guy won Wimbledon, and Spain won the Euro Cup, and my mom's from Argentina. Argentina won the Copa America. It was a good day. God was good to me last Sunday, right? And it reminded Sandy and I of, of years earlier when we were in Spain when they win the Euro Cup. That was the last time that they had won it, quite a while ago. And while we were there, uh, we, we had dinner with one of my classmates. I only had 11 classmates, 11 students in our class. And her name was Luthina. She invited us to dinner. And uh, so there we are having dinner with her. And uh, uh, before we go to her house, sorry, uh, Sandy, like, we got to take something. So we take flowers or something? The flower shop was closed. We could, I go, let's go to the supermarket. Let's take a bottle of wine. We'll take something, right? So we went into the supermarket. And you know, there's that, that, those rows and rows and rows of wines. And I'm like, I don't, I, I don't know what to grab. I, I don't know what's good, you know? And so I'm like, I'm just looking. I don't, I don't have a sophisticated palate to know what wine is good and what wine is not good. So I'm just looking at the labels and what looks cool. And, and then you pick up a bottle like, ooh, that's expensive, right? And then I say to Sandy, you know, just like us, Luthina won't know. She won't know what, if it's a good bottle of wine or not. So let's go to this bottom row right here. <laughs> and I picked up a five-euro bottle of wine. That's about seven bucks. Cheap, right? I go, let's just get this. She'll never know. It's just a thought that counts. We'll just t- scratch the price off. You know, we'll give it to her. We're good. So that's what we did, seven euros. We showed up at her house. Ah, Luthina, how are you? Frank, how are you? Her husband gave him a hug. Here's the bottle of wine, right? And uh, then we went out onto the patio. We sat down. She immediately opened it up and poured it. We were all there. For the next hour or two hours, we're just catching up. Eventually, we get to, well, what are you doing for work? Sandy, how's your, how's your accounting uh, finances uh, job going? And so Sandy explains that. It, Frank, her husband, how's your, how's your project management job going? He just explained that. David, how's your pastor job going? I explained that. Luthina, what are you doing in life right now? What are you doing in life? She says to us, she says, well, I work for a high-end, exclusive manufacturer of exquisite wines. And we are building exclusive clubs and, and wineries in Barcelona, Paris, and London. And I'm like, now I know why she got rid of that wine as quick as she wanted to get that crap out of her house as fast as possible. So I'm like, oh, this is awful, right? So, you know, the evening ends. We have dinner. The evening ends. We're walking out. And I give Luthina a big hug. She was a good friend. I said, it's so good to see you. I'm so glad you're doing well. And then I added, I don't know, it just slipped out. I said, and I sure hope you enjoyed the bottle of wine Sandy picked out for you. <laughs> and there we were. Threw her under the bus. No problem. Now listen. Just like Luthina is an expert at wine... God is an expert at life. He's an expert at life, especially difficult life. Difficult life. You know, verse 1, some people translate it like this. How long, Lord, will you forsake me? Do you remember someone else who said and used those very same words? It was Jesus on the cross. And he said to God, Why have you forsaken me? And Jesus says to you today, you feel forgotten? You feel forsaken? You're in good company. I know what that feels like. I know what that feels like. Now, here's what you need to know. You need to understand that as Jesus hung on that cross and as he died on that cross, and as God the Father for a short while turned his back on Jesus because he was covered with your sin and with my sin, He did that. He turned his back on Jesus so he would never have to turn his back on you. And David says, I trust in your unfailing love. The second thing he does is this. He embraces the Lord's salvation. He says, I rejoice in your salvation. You go, how the heck can I rejoice? You don't even know the garbage that's in my life, David. You don't even know the family situation. You can't even comprehend the work situation. You can't even fathom the financial stress I'm in right now. How can I, how can I experience joy? And my answer to you is tactfully as I could possibly say, is the mistake you're making is that you're focusing on the temporal. You're not focusing on the eternal. You're, you're focusing on your job, your career, your finances, your health, instead of focusing on your justification 
your redemption, and your ultimate glorification because of what Jesus has done for you. And the minute you start to put those things in perspective, you, like David, can say, my heart rejoices in your salvation. Now, for those of you who have never done that, I want to make sure that I say and verbalize this. The number one solution to your despondency, depression, and sadness, the number one solution is to embrace Jesus as your Savior, your Lord, and your best friend. None of the rest of what I'm covering really matters unless you take that step. And in a room this size, there's always someone. And so why not today be that day of salvation for you where you say yes to Jesus? I don't understand it all, but I understand enough what you did on the cross for me. Here's the last thing that he does, and with this we're going to end. Choose to worship through song. This is very interesting at the end. Verse 6, I will sing the Lord's praise. He doesn't say, I want to sing. He doesn't even say, I am singing. No, no, I will sing the Lord's praise. It's understanding the, the therapeutic nature of music and in particular worship for those of us who are Christians. What it does to your soul when you listen to worship music and or you sing worship music. Someone has said this, you don't sing because you're happy. You're happy because you sing. And this is David saying, you know one of the solutions? God isn't maybe gonna take the problem away, but as I worship, it begins to heal my soul. It begins to heal my soul. Sounds like a train's coming through. You know, this past week I bumped into a story about a guy by the name of Tommy Dorsey. Tommy Dorsey was and is considered the father of gospel music. And he was a jazz musician and uh, he got saved and he began to compose gospel music. He, as a young man, got married and uh, his wife got pregnant. And the story is told that one day he got up super early from his apartment in Chicago that's where they lived, and he drove to St. Louis where he had a gig that night. And he performed on the gig, and as he was coming down off the stage, a young boy handed him a telegram with four words on it. Your wife is dead. He immediately got in his car, he drove back to Chicago as quickly as he could. And apparently what had happened is that she'd gone into labor early and she had died while giving birth to their son. So on the one hand, he was overjoyed because he had a son. On the other hand, he was grief-stricken because his wife just died. To make matters worse, later that night, his newborn son died. And within three days, he buried his wife and his son in the same casket. And Tommy Dorsey went into a horrible depression. As you can imagine, I, I, I can't even process going through that. And he, um, he locked himself in his apartment. He isolated himself from everybody. He closed all the shades. No light coming into his apartment. Finally, one day, he allowed one of his friends in. And his friend just listened. And then his friend said this to them. He said, you know, Tommy, maybe what you should do, put your hands on the piano. Put your hands on the piano. See what happens. And what happened is probably one of the greatest gospel songs ever written. It's a song called Precious Lord. I want you to imagine this man and the pain he's going through as he writes these words. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Let me stand. I am tired. I am weak. I am worn through the storm, through the night. Lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When the way grows drear, I didn't know what that word meant. It means dark, grim, depressing. When my way grows drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry. Hear my call. Hold my hand, lest I fall. 
Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. And then the last verse, when darkness appears and the night draws near and the day is past and gone, at the river I stand, guide my feet, hold my hand. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Heavenly Father, we come to you today so incredibly grateful for your word and how practical it is. And whatever this situation David was going through, it speaks to our hearts and it speaks to our minds about understanding that tough times come and what to do and how to bounce back. And I pray that we would take some of what we've learned and apply it. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'm just wondering if you walked in here today going through a tough time going through a crisis, filled with sadness in your life. If you would just raise your hand so I could see that and pray for you. Anyone, I see that hand. Anyone else? See those hands. Anyone else? Heavenly Father, I pray for these friends that have said it hurts. I put a smile on in the lobby, but in my heart, I'm, I'm hurting. They're going through a valley. They're going through a darkness. Father, as we just reflected on this song, precious Lord, hold their hand. Precious Lord, take them home. Hold them up through the storm, precious Lord.